of a battery that was dead. You know, what's the matter with them? I mean, after all, this is NASA, right? They can do everything. They can, they can launch. They can put a ship up in orbit, and they can't fix them. A screw and a handle. Yeah. OTC, BCC. Go ahead, BCC. OK, uh, we're bringing the screw out now. OK, copy that. And uh, be advised, we will be needing to do a water drain. NASA decided on a 24-hour turnaround. But there was a new problem at the weather station. We prepared a forecast for the next day. We still had some concern over the winds, but we knew the winds would be decreasing, probably to within limits. The real concern for the next day was the very cold temperatures that we expected to come in the area. And we put a 12-hour forecast uh, together and presented it to the uh, mission management people at, at which the, we forecast low temperatures of uh, 24 degrees at the pad for the next morning. 24 degrees Fahrenheit was exceptionally cold for Florida and indications were that it would drop as low as 18 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 10 degrees centigrade. NASA engineers recalled that a year earlier, Morton Thiokol had expressed concern about launching at low temperatures. A call was made to Utah. There was another program manager came by my, uh, my office and says, Bob, are you concerned about an 18 degree Fahrenheit launch? I says, what? because we're qualified to only 40 degrees. I said, what business has anyone even got thinking about that? We're in no man's land. We're in a big gray area. Ebling asked for the O-Ring task force team to assemble in his office. The O-Rings had never been tested below freezing. And now the estimated temperatures were some 15 degrees colder. We discussed what might happen below our 40 degree qualification temperature. And uh, practically to the man, we all decided it was catastrophic. Thiokol immediately contacted NASA's rocket specialists. Thiokol recommended that we not launch until it warmed up in the afternoon. Well, I told Thiokol they couldn't make that kind of recommendation, that they would have to make a, they would have to give us a temperature at which they could launch. It was agreed they would have a teleconference in two hours when Thiokol engineers would make a formal presentation. With the launch only 15 hours away, both sides knew they were working against the clock. We all, as individual engineers, scurried to our offices, took out whatever we deemed necessary to make a presentation, to present the rationale that would prevent a launch. Uh, unfortunately, in that hurried preparation, uh, we did not have time for a dry run. I had no idea what my colleagues were gonna present, and they had no idea what I was gonna bring to the meeting. Although the presentation was unrehearsed, Thiokol thought that their arguments were clear and well presented. Oh yeah, they were good charts. Some of them were handwritten charts, but uh, we just didn't have time to uh, process them through a typewriter or a computer or anything. But the charts were good and they were very explicit. They uh, says, here's the way it is. And we wish we had better data, but we don't. Thiokol engineers argued that the colder the temperature, the slower the O-rings would seal. If both primary and secondary O-rings failed, hot gas would leak and cause a catastrophic explosion. Their conclusion was unanimous. We recommended no launch. The entire Thiokol group recommended no launch. Thiokol set a minimum launch temperature of 53 degrees Fahrenheit. 11 degrees centigrade and assumed NASA would simply rubber stamp their conclusion. But they were wrong. Well, I thought it was a very poor briefing. To be making a briefing like that about something as important as flight safety uh, the night before the launch, I thought it was an extremely poor briefing. NASA engineers at Marshall started to pull apart Thiokol's presentation 
arguing that their data was contradictory and inconclusive. You don't do engineering by emotion. I mean, I, you can't get up there and say, hey, I got a gut feeling this thing's going to blow up. I mean, you know, they'll take you to the funny farm. We're always probed as to the soundness of the rationale that we're presenting. But that night, I was hammered way beyond what I'd ever experienced as, as an engineer ever in the aerospace industry. Those Flacco people thought that we were being nasty to them or something. The, the arguments were so vehement and uh, vociferous or whatever. We always did that with our contractors, but uh, what we did that night was mild compared to what we normally did. No temperature guideline had ever been established for the O-rings. Not being able to launch below 11 degrees centigrade would destroy the shuttle's ambitious schedule. But NASA could not launch against a contractor's recommendation. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm listening to the data. The only thing I remember telling George uh, Hardy, sitting right here, I said, George, I said, if these guys persist in this recommendation not to launch, I said, we well, can't launch. And George agreed with me. I mean, we were, we were at their mercy. NASA concluded that they were not convinced of any correlation between low temperature and O-ring failure. Fiacle asked for a five-minute recess. As soon as the button was pressed on a teleconference to sever us and mute us between us and NASA, our general manager said in a soft voice, we have to make a management decision. It was obvious that they were going to change the decision or attempt to write things on a piece of paper that justified changing it from a no launch to a launch decision to accommodate their major customer. Beaujoli and his colleague Arnie Thompson argued that the launch was 20 degrees outside their operating experience and emphatically not worth the risk. I thought surely the photographs I have in my possession will certainly change this whole caucus. I placed those photographs down in front of the managers and I was told after the meeting by one of my colleagues that I was literally screaming at them to look at the photos and not ignore what they were telling us. It's very simple. The more black you see between the seals, the lower temperature launch, and the closer you come to a disaster. It's as simple as that. I couldn't get them to even look at the photographs. The general manager turned to his three senior managers and asked what they wanted to do. Two agreed to launch, but the third was undecided. So he turns to him and in no uncertain terms tells him, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. And that's exactly what happened. He changed hats and he changed his vote. Just 30 minutes prior, he's the one that gave the conclusions and recommendations charts at the main engineering meeting to not launch below 53 degrees Fahrenheit. When the teleconference resumed, Firekel stated their new position. They were now in favor of launching. NASA did not ask why they had changed their minds. That was stupid. That's what, uh, I mean, we should have asked him. I mean, that was dumb on our part. You know, they had, they had, we should have, we should have said, give us your rationale for changing them out. Now, what they did was, they presented the, the rationale for go. Kilminster did that. And, and, and he had a good rationale. I didn't agree with one single statement made on the chart by the managers. In fact, they made some statements that they couldn't possibly have the data to back up the statements because there was nobody closer to that joint than myself and Arnie Thompson. And both of us could not have made statements that those managers made on that chart. But NASA assumed the change of mind was unanimous. If a guy sits in a meeting, which is a go for launch meeting, and he doesn't stand up in front of the train to stop it, he's go. And nobody stood up. So everybody was go for launch. With the contractor's new launch recommendation in their hands, NASA managers were not required to report the night's events up the chain of command. The O-ring issue was considered closed. It was 11.15 p.m., 10 hours to launch, and everyone left as quickly as possible. And, and I remember going home telling my wife,